for many communities living in high altitude areas like the Himalayas, livestock and fishing are important livelihood options. Since agriculture is challenging at these high altitudes. But with changing climate, deforestation and excessive development, many of these communities struggle to make ends meet, whether the focus is on cattle, fishing or dairy. Science and innovation can help them push productivity and find solutions to a host of other challenges on the ground. We take you to two of the world's most unique research institutes, ICAR's Directorate of Cold Water Fisheries in Bhimtal and the National Research Centre for Yak in Dirang, Arunachal Pradesh. To see how these national institutes are leveraging science to propagate and save these species and in the process improving the socio-economic condition of the communities to become self-reliant. Fish have always played a big role in our economy. Fishing provides full-time or part-time employment to 14.66 million people in India. Over the last couple of decades, Indian fisheries have advanced tremendously in a range of areas. There are numerous subcategories of fishing, marine fisheries, inland fisheries, freshwater aquaculture, brackish water aquaculture, and then there are cold water fisheries. Mountain regions are characterized by the presence of cold waters, many of which harbor fish and support largely subsistence fisheries. When we talk about cold water, we usually refer to fish in water where the temperature ranges from 5 to 25 degrees centigrade. The water temperature under cold water fisheries should not be more than 25 degrees centigrade even in the summers. Such conditions occur in Himalayan and the peninsular regions of India, which would include the central highlands and the Deccan Plateau. India has significant resources in terms of upland rivers or streams, high and low altitudes natural lakes in addition to man-made reservoirs existing both in Himalayan regions and the Western Ghats. Now cold water fisheries have a great potential in generating rural income and providing food security to locals in Indian highlands where vegetation and economic activity are both sparse due to the topography and climatic conditions. Especially in the mountain region of Jammu and Kashmir, Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim in the north and Nilgiris and the Western Ghats in the south. The Indian Council of Agriculture Research Directorate of Cold Water Fisheries Research ICAR DCFR Bhimtal is a national organization pushing research and development in this area. They have been contributing towards the production, management and conservation of cold water fisheries. ICAR DCFR has promoted hill aquaculture through scientific innovations, technological improvements and farmer oriented approaches. Their goal has been to enhance the income of the farmer and promote the overall development of cold water fisheries sector in the country. Many of the communities living in the high altitude do not have other resources for income generation. So, cold water fisheries sector is a critical sector that could augment their livelihood security. The institute's work is focused on two main areas the assessment and management of cold water fishery resources and the enhancement of productivity of cold water aquaculture development. It also focuses on ecotourism and recreational fisheries by promoting production of cold water exotic fish species like rainbow trout which on culturing can bring economic prosperity to the farmer as well as contribute to the nutritional needs of the entire upland ecosystem. Now recently we did a study and we found there are 273 species are available in cold water sector. So reassessment and management of cold water fisheries resources, you know the system and species diversification 
of our cold water aquaculture, development of technology, and all this technology should be towards farmer safety efforts. Whatever technology we develop, basically it should benefit the farmers of the high altitudinal region, farmers of the you know upland regions. DCFR has also developed technology of economically viable cold water fish species such as Mahasi, snow trout, minor carps and even trout for enhancing production. Let's look at their work in a little more detail. The institute is actively working across the Himalayan region. One of the fish they are working on is the rainbow trout. The rainbow trout is an exotic fish introduced in India from the countries in the northern hemisphere like the UK, Norway, North America and Russia. The optimum temperature required for the growth of this fish is 14 to 18 degree. It thrives in clean, well oxygenated water with over 80% saturation level. They can survive below the ice in winter and feed and grow in summer. Metabolic rate goes down in winter. Hence, it is best suited for aquaculture in coal fisheries. The institute did a project in Sikkim, where rainbow trout farming is not as popular as in other states like Kashmir or Arunachal Pradesh. The local farmers were shown the benefits of trout fishing and were given suitable technological interventions to improve their techniques with the right adoption of policies for sustainable growth and farming. This industry has been growing significantly over the last decade. Trout production ventures are being taken up by public as well as private enterprises pushing Sikkim ahead in this sector. The institute has also done a lot of work in the study of their chocolate and golden masi fish, an endangered species. The institute has established a hatchery. Training is given to the state fisheries development officers so that this fish can be reintroduced in many rivers and aquatic systems. The institute is also simultaneously working to enhance the productive ratio of the Mahseer through best management practices and technological innovations. Productivity is a key economic indicator of the relationship between input quantities and the amount of output produced. The power of this technology is that you can place anywhere, like you can, uh, since the water is, and the land requirement is very less, and you can control the water parameters of a given amount of water. Uh, another advantage is that because we are controlling all the parameters, the fish growth is much faster than the traditional flow through system. To give an example, uh, for rising the table size fishes to of 800 to 1 kg, we require 5 months of farming here in this system. whereas in in the flow through system, it requires almost uh, 12 to 16 months. And the second uh, point to add is that the feed utilization is much better in this system. The feed wastage is less. The institute also experiments with recirculatory aquaculture system. This is a technology where water is recycled and reused after mechanical and biological filtration and removal of suspended matter and metabolites. Let's see how this works. The institute has four tanks of six cubic meters which are used for growing the fishes from when they are tiny till they reach a marketable size. The tanks are made of fiber reinforced plastic. The fish are initially at a size of 20 grams each and they grow for four to five months until they reach the table size. They excrete ammonia through their gills. Since the ammonia is excreted in the water itself, the water can become toxic if too much ammonia accumulates. The fecal matter generated will also need to be removed. This is done through the process of sedimentation and water screening. Through the process of sedimentation, most solids settle at the bottom, where they are washed out. To remove suspended solids, the waters pass through a 40 micron drum screen mesh, which acts like a stream. There is an automatic system which cleans the screen as and when required. Ammonia is removed by the process of biological nitrification. Biological nitrification is the process of converting ammonia in wastewater to nitrate using aerobic autotrophic bacteria in the treatment process. 
two different types of autotrophic bacteria are used that oxidize ammonia to nitrite and then oxidize nitrite to nitrate. Biological nitrification systems are designed to completely convert all ammonia to nitrate. Once ammonia is detoxified, water is again disinfected for any pathogenic microorganism through either UV disinfection or ozone. And oxygen is added since the fish require oxygen during the process. Once the water is introduced back to the tanks through a 24-7 centrifugal pump, this system works well even when there is very little water. Another advantage is that since all parameters are controlled, fish growth is much faster than traditional flow-through system and feed utilization is also better in this system. Total feed conversion ratio is much higher in this system, which makes it economically viable for a farmer. One of the challenges in cold water sector is the feed and seed. Cold water aquaculture is done mostly in remote areas and it is a challenge obtaining quality seed or eggs in time. In rainbow trout farming, for example, most of the production cost comes from the feed. Earlier what happened, you know, there was a no custom, I mean, I mean uh, specialized rainbow trout feed which is produced by a, I mean, very good companies. So we developed, we took a, undertook a series of research during last 10 years and we develop, you know, starter feed as well as grow out feed. And the performance of this feed, like in terms of protein efficiency, in terms of FCR, in terms of, you know, the um, well, growth, in terms of survival, in terms of other aspects, it outperformed the earlier feed, existing feed. Now we have done a commercialization. Whatever we seed feed produce, we will be able to produce from the institute side and we cannot, you know, send to each and every farmers. Let us take a look at how is feed developed at the institute. Most of the feeding trials happen at the recirculating aquaculture facility because it helps in controlling the environmental parameters. Fishes are kept separately in three replicate tanks and different feeds are formulated. Then it is observed how much of the feed the fishes are actively consuming till they are fed to saturation. Based on that, the feed intake of the fish is measured. At the end of 12 weeks of feeding, it is calculated as to how much feed is converted to body weight. And then, growth parameters are studied. Based on this, we can see how much the feed is reflecting on the phenotype of the animal. Then whole body samples are collected and analyzed to get profiles for lipids, proteins, moisture content, amino acids, etc. DNA in genes responsible for growth, immunity, stress tolerance, etc. are also studied. The end result is basically a well-evaluated feed formulation which will be very healthy for the fish to grow as well as for their welfare. The institute is also looking to develop engineer-validated technology that has an ease of operation and is affordable for the farmer. Research programs in that direction are underway to develop technology that is economically viable and easy to install so that the farmers remain open to aquaculture prospects. To become Atman River, actually every farmer's income should be, you know, enhanced. We are doing some, you know, program, we are taking some program through our, you know, TSP program, through our SCSP program, through our Meragao Meragora program, through our NEH activities, and we are demonstrating all our technologies, like technology for rainbow trout farming in flow through the Swiss, technology of rainbow trout farming through RAS, we are going to demonstrate soon, then seed production of masir, then uh, production of fish through polyline techniques, then aqua gardening concept is one of the things which is really economically viable for the farmers. Institutes like this will help push our self-reliance goals. The technologies here, like the recirculatory aquaculture system technology, was developed indigenously. The innovation developed here can not only enhance livelihood, but ensure nutrient security and address the issues of water depletion by ensuring minimum water is used. But 
what about other animals in the area which provide livelihood options to local communities? How is science supporting them? Stunning landscapes and unique flora and fauna provides habitat to some of the rarest wild animals as well as unique domesticated ones. One such animal is the mighty yak. It is a type of ox, also called the ship of the mountains, with relatively long hair and a massive belt. In India, the yak is found in the states of Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim, Himachal Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Ladakh, Uttarakhand and West Bengal. The animal thrives in high altitude areas. It can survive in temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees. It has adapted to efficiently conserve body heat during the winter months. Domesticated by the locals living in the high altitude areas of the Himalayas, the yak is an important source for meat, fiber and milk. In ancient times, yak caravans plied on the silk route for traders to cross the high mountain passes of the Himalayas. The animal also holds an important place in cultural and religious folklore of the entire region. The impressive Yak Cham Bhutia dance honors the yak and the simple lifestyle of the herdsmen and is performed in Buddhist monasteries of the region. From an economic perspective, it is estimated that the yak can single-handedly fulfill more than 60% of the livelihood requirements of the local communities which rear them. But the population of the yak across the Himalayas is rapidly declining due to inbreeding climate change, diseases, shrinking grazing pastures and the lifestyle changes of the herdsmen. Yak farming is very difficult. It requires a lot of hard work. And today's generation is not used to this practice of yak farming. Earlier, there was no other means of livelihood and people were not educated enough to get jobs. So having a yak was the only option. Working to stabilize and propagate the yak population in India is the ICAR, National Research Center for Yak at the Reng, West Kaming District of Arunachal Pradesh. Established in 1989, this National Research Center and its specialized teams of dedicated scientists are engaged in the exclusive research and development of scientific management practices including techniques to increase the yak's productivity and profitability. We are working on different area of yak husbandry like on yak reproduction, yak nutrition, yak health, yak genetics, yak physiology and yak product processing. The main aim is that how we can improve overall yak husbandry in country as well as how we can benefit the farming community which are rearing at yak in high altitudes for their livelihood sport. The Yak Institute has a dedicated farm spread over 200 hectares some 30 kilometers from the rank town at an altitude of 2700 meters or 8800 feet. The Nayukma Dung farm's location was carefully chosen, surrounded by lush green forests. The mountain slopes are ideal for large yak enclosures and there is plenty of land for growing special grasses which the yak graze on. Yaks have traditionally been reared under the annual transhuman system. Transhumans is a form of nomadic pastoralism 
where livestock like yak are moved by herdsmen to high mountain pastures during the summer months and are brought down to lower altitudes during the winters. One of the main challenges faced by the yak herders is shrinking of traditional grazing pastures due to human activity and overgrazing. During winters, it is estimated that yaks lose 25 to 30 percent of their weight due to scarcity of fodder which then leads to less milk production and a low birthing of calves. To mitigate this challenge, the Yak Institute, after intensive research, has developed complete feed block technology to supplement the animal's natural food chain. Uh, we NRC and uh, uh, Yak developed the complete feed block technology and in this technology we mix uh, yeah, roughages and concentrated uh, uh, feeds uh, uh, along with some uh, binding agents that, that are called uh, the uh, molasses and the, uh, mi uh, the mix, uh, total mix uh, mixers is uh, compressed by using complete feed block making machines and these feed blocks are uh, regularly uh, feeding to our uh, uh, farm animals, uh, um, especially during winter. And under our TSP program, that is Tribal Supply uh, Plan programs, we NRC are uh, distributing the feed blocks to the uh, farmers which, uh, which are rearing yaks at high altitudes. The feed blocks comprise of locally available feed resources like paddy straw mixed with roughages, tree leaves, molasses and even minerals. The concentration of the mix depends on the physiological needs of the animals. To prepare the complete feed block, roughage is cut into small parts and mixed with concentrate feed mixtures. Molasses or melted jaggery is then used for the densification of the fodder. Once all the components are mixed properly, it goes into the feed block making machine. The mixture is put into the filler and a pressure of 3000 pound per cubic centimeter is put on the mixture to create the feed block. The institute distributes these feed blocks to the tribal community of yak herders under the central government scheme called the Tribal Supply Programme. The program has been very successful in combating the winter feed crisis of the yaks. Field trials conducted by the institute in remote locations during winters have demonstrated that yaks recoup 25 to 30 percent of their body weight when provided with feed block supplements. The institute has also developed mineral mixtures and concentrated yak feeds which provide balanced nutrition to the yaks. These innovations and techniques have shown good results with both growing and lactating animals. A crucial area of research and development for ICAR NRCY is on the yak's reproductive health as well as the challenge of inbreeding which reduces the useful characteristics of the animal and makes them vulnerable to disease. The standard technique being used is artificial insemination. But important research is taking place on embryo transfer technology, ETT, and in vitro fertilization. The Institute achieved success in both these processes. Mishmo was the first ETT calf produced and Norgal, the first IVF calf on the 7th of July 2006. But the main technology which the institute has standardized for propagating the yak is artificial insemination, AI with frozen semen technology. Uh, we collect the oocytes from the female when they are alive from the, uh, with the help of ultrasound and then we bring it to the lab, we mature these oocytes and at the same time we collect the yak semen and we also prepare it and then we do in vitro fertilization, in laboratory fertilization in a small uh, droplet where the media is suitable for the fertilization. Once this embryo is developed, we either cryopreserve it or we transfer it into a surrogate mother. In surrogate mother, once we are implanting it, so it starts developing like a normal embryo. And after 
completion of its gestation period, we can have a calf. Let's see how this process works. Elite yak bulls are selected from the herd. These bulls are about 3 to 4 years old and are trained to donate semen in an artificial vagina. Collected semen is evaluated for the physical characteristic. This is then diluted with Tris Egg Yolk Glycerol Extender. This is a liquid diluent which is added to the semen to preserve its fertilizing ability. It is then filled in 0.5 ml semen straws and cryopreserved in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees centigrade. These frozen semen straws can be transported to different yak rearing states for purposes of artificial insemination. When yak females are on heat, frozen semen straws are thawed and used for artificial insemination. In yaks, artificial insemination is performed twice. 10 to 12 hours apart while the female is in heat. The AI technology's conception rate is above 65% and has been used in the production of more than 100 elite calves under farm conditions. The institute is also working to develop various products from the yak as well as popularizing them. The yak's fiber wool is one such product. It's made of amorphous material which means that water does not go through it and even provides warmth in minus 40 degree temperatures and is 17% lighter than merino wool. Yak fiber wool has been used by the locals in the trans Himalayan region for over a thousand years to make clothing, tents, ropes and blankets. More recently, the fiber is increasingly being used in the garment industry to produce premium priced clothing and accessories. Yak milk is used in making cheese, churkam or candy and paneer. The milk has a fragrant and sweetish smell while the yak meat is relished by local communities. These technological improvements have been embraced by the farmers in the region who were earlier reluctant to take up yak husbandry because of low profitability. The work being undertaken by the ICAR NRCY by leveraging science and technology is not only helping to preserve and protect the important and vulnerable yak but is also helping raise the socio-economic status of some of the most marginalized high altitude tribal communities. Institutes like these, who work with animals in specific regions, can make a huge difference to the farmers in this area who struggle to make a living. They also bring in methods that can help the community work in a sustainable way. They help in diversification, improving productivity and push the community and eventually the nation on its path to self-reliance.